Well, talk about special guests. You know, I say that a lot, but this week, I think I truly, truly mean it for multitude of reasons, which we'll get into. But I want to welcome to Cloud and Clear, the newly minted managing director of telecom, media, and entertainment at Google Cloud, Tina Piccione. Hello. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here today with you. I'm so happy that you're here, and I'm so happy that you coached me on how to get your name right right before the call. <laughs> hey, it's a you know joint effort, collaboration at its finest. That's right. I mean, I feel like I've known you for a decade, even though we've known each other probably for only a few months. And I say newly minted, and there's a story behind that. Uh, before we get into all of that, I just want the audience to really learn about Tina, the leader, Tina the human, and of course your career story in terms of how you got into technology and how you got the roles that you got in these various places before you got to Google Cloud. Why don't we start there? It's as good of a starting place. Sure. So mine is a winding journey. So uh, starting back in a career, I always wanted to be a singer, but decided um, I couldn't make enough money to live. So went into technology and fell in love with it um, and started at AT&T, actually back at Bell South Long Distance, which will date me, uh, but had a ball at Bell South and then merged into AT&T and had a great 18 year run at AT&T, ending up in the big data space. So being able to build it from the ground up as a startup and really at the time, this was the latest and greatest thing in the marketplace and starting it with everybody was really connecting to the industry and having something totally brand new to be able to talk about. So it was fantastic. And after leaving AT&T, I went to Fidelity and ran their technology and ended up as chief operating officer there. And then into RTI International, which is an international nonprofit group. So a very different career as it spanned across, but had a ball all the way through it and gave every opportunity as a stepping stone to the next in different industries. So telecom to finance to nonprofit and now to Google. No, I think what a lot of people don't realize, certainly from the outside, is how technically progressive like AT&T and telecom players in general have had to be in the last 15 years, especially because like it wasn't like hyperscalers and cloud and things we take for granted now didn't really exist in the, in the current state, but there was organizations solving huge data problems for themselves and their customers for like the last 20 years plus. Oh, absolutely. AT&T was at the cutting edge of this and we had technologies that was well before its time. So whether it was in healthcare where AT&T actually had devices that we came up with, whether it was in the launch of the iPhone where we were working through that and then as well getting into all the data. So to your point, the massive amounts of data that flowed through AT&T, we had to figure out what to do with it, how to secure it, how to ensure that it was encrypted at rest and in motion. So having to have that piece of technology and know how to do it, that was at the core of what everything was expected by us. So uh, log into the career, you had to know exactly from a network standpoint, how it was going to work, how the reliability was going to work, how the security was going to work. And so when cloud came to being, we laughed, we were like, well, we've been doing data for so long, this is kind of up on our wheelhouse. So it made it for an interesting career, being able to keep up in the forefront of the technology. Yeah, and, and you look, know, telecom players were always extremely important and relevant when it came to data centers, any, any data centers, whether it was AT&T data centers that hosted your data and other customers' data, but anybody who was getting into the data center space, like without like the handshake rooms and the interconnects and the fat pipes and all the evolution of that technology, like none of what we see today would have been possible because that was like the foundational architecture of what we, again, completely take for granted today, right? Oh, absolutely. If you think about it, this is what's you know exciting is 
back then we had to figure out things that now, you know, we don't give a second thought to, but think about it. We had to figure out phone number portability. So what do you do with all these phone numbers, right? And then you want to take them and move them between companies. So we actually had to work together and collaborate and across all the telcos. And then you think about all the data that went back and forth. How do you make sure again, it's going back and forth in the data centers and the call centers? How do you make sure it's an effortless experience for the customer and they get one customer journey? So all of that produces lots of data and it produces lots of challenges. And still to this day, it's still an evolution as we go forward. So as cloud started emerging as the next big thing, the telcos were already thinking about it. And the other thing yes, you lived through was, I think the expansion by, by the telcos or the carriers or cable companies sort of around the same time where the business model was expanding. And certainly one of the areas it was expanding into was entertainment itself. And I remember one of the business school case studies I, I did, and that was at USC 2008, 2010. And our last case study was, I think, the uh, Comcast, NBC, Universal a merger, which was like, we were used to like the media companies making acquisitions. And now we had, wait a minute, the people that own the plumbing and the distribution were buying media companies and it was like almost, it was like the power dynamic had shifted, but also what became relevant is like the importance of content, you know, and how that is all going to work. And of course, all this time, like Netflix, Netflix is coming up and stuff like that. So how was that transformation of what used to be like feeds and speeds and, and numbers and IPs to like, and data to like, now we're in the, entertainment business and the satellite business and all these other things. Right. And you had to figure out streaming. So if you think about it, as we started in the telcos, um, we lived and died by pennies on a quarter. And it was the uh, plain old telephone lines, right? So as we went from plain old telephone lines to cell phones, we had to make big bets on what was next. So whether it was in security for the home, which most of the telcos looked at, and then turned around and said, this isn't it and not going to scale us to the numbers that we need. That's when we started looking at media and entertainment. And you look at entertainment and you say, really, it's on the same pipes to your point. So how do we turn around and utilize that to where we can make advancements with it? And it keeps the same customer to where they go, wherever they go, they're going to have one customer experience. So whether it's on their plain old telephone line, their cell phone, their mobile device, and then they can utilize them all together and combine it. So now you're putting the power of all of the technology into the palm of their hands and they can take it wherever they go. And that sticky glues, which is such a technical term, but it sticky glues the customer back to the company. So it it would remain that you would be loyal to AT&T or you'd be loyal to Verizon or you'd be loyal to whoever is owning that technology. So that was the big bet that the companies were then making. And being able to figure that out wasn't easy or effortless. As you think about it, you now had to think even billing systems. How do you bring everything to one, right? Yeah. 33 oh. back-end systems now goes to one. How do you make sure it's that great customer experience? So again, it was quite challenging, but it's where the future is. And I think if you look back, it's the AT&T labs that always look 20 years in advance, oh, yeah. <clears throat> right? What's next? How do you make the big bets? I mean, you think about it now, um, Disney does the same thing. How do you make the big bets? What's the carousel of progress? How are you going to be the next yeah. big thing and stay relevant? Because yeah. the phone, the phones, most people haven't even seen a telephone line in so long. Most won't know what they are. And as the technology went away and the payphone technology went away and people still look at it like, what is it? Now it's how do we get the next bet? How do we get the next big thing? How are we going to keep growing? So that's why they're having to continue to evolutionize and grow into conglomerates, to be honest, that now they're having to figure out what to do with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> you, you said, you said, uh, the Southern Bell. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it was a monopoly. It was like a monopoly single system, almost a nationalized system. That's correct. Up again. And then 
coming back, you know, into, into <laughs> very few carriers and now kind of very few media entertainment companies, right? Like all kind of competing for uh, similar things. And, 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 you know, we're as consumers, we're experiencing this. And I was just laughing with my friends the other day. We're like, I was like, I was like, remember cutting the cord, but like, but you, but like you need an internet connection and mobile service. You need both. You definitely need a fast internet connection, especially now work from home, COVID, study yeah. and all. But then like, okay, then, but okay. So you don't have, you can cut the cable service, but then you need like Netflix and then also Hulu and then Apple plus has a service. And then you need, you know, HBO max plus Don't forget and Disney then, plus for all the kids. Definitely <laughs> Disney plus. That's some unique content. And like, you're like, it's actually not cheaper than it was before at all. No. And then you add in <laughs> CBS all access and everybody has their own slice of the way to do it. Yeah. And so money, I, you know, I added up our bills the other day and my entertainment bill was huge. By the time you add in the internet and you add in all of the different access um, that not only we have, but I have two college kids. Look, and you're, you're probably not going out to dinner. You're not going on vacations <laughs> right now. We're locked down. You know, it is what oh, it is. It's, and it's worth it at that point, right? So we can have the four iPads and the three TVs going at once and the computer going in every room. Uh, so it's a total different environment. COVID has yeah. really changed a lot of the way we think, and it's caused everybody and every company to have to react. They're having to transform yeah. at a nanosecond. Yeah, Whereas sorry. before, they were sitting back and a little bit comfortable. Now there's no way they can be comfortable because they've had to change not only the way they work, but the way they deliver services. I mean, even the internet and mobile carriers, who obviously some do both, but like, Nobody thought of, we needed like T1 level, like fiber to the house everywhere. Like, yeah, Verizon, Fio, some, some very specific markets had it, but like now you need that synchronous up and down. It's not just down anymore. And like every house needs it. So they're trying to react because we're all going to probably do this for a while. And a lot of what we do is not going to go back completely. And nobody ever thought of enterprise class data service, 5G, all of that to the house until, you know, very oh, recently. Exactly. And if you think about it, it traditionally, it was sharing some of it, right? As it went to the Ooh. curb. So there would be four houses, they would share it. So if you were the one working from home, you got the lion's share of it and some of the rest yeah. didn't. Yeah. Well, now with everybody at home, the customers are demanding that they have the same lion's share all the way down the stream. Yeah. And so as you look in neighborhoods, you can have three or four different internet providers now as people are switching because they're frustrated because they need the service because you have kids taking courses online at home. You've got people trying to use the internet on a daily basis. You have us connecting instead of being on a plane and getting to see each other. Yeah. We're now connecting through the internet and we have to be up. So yeah. it creates a whole new dynamic. And what's interesting is we have, we have many clients in the space. I can't name all of them, but they're all vying for what's next along these lines. Lines. And there's also people out of the left field, like SpaceX and their Starlink and their satellites. It's like, like they're completely changing the game. They're like, forget all this infrastructure. I'm just putting ten thousand satellites up there. And like, exactly. Like, so nobody can stand still, which is the beauty of you know competition and our systems and uh, totally. uh, at least instills all the right behavior of innovation, continued innovation. But AT and T Labs, classic as a nerd. Very few organizations have more patents than at and Labs, maybe IBM, but that's it, right? Like that's that is correct. Huh, such an amazing place of innovation. Um, I want to want to step back and talk about content for a second because, yeah. and 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 you know, Quibi is sought a customer, LA based, uh, near and dear to my heart. But what we've seen in the last five, ten years with what Disney has done, what Netflix has done. Now Hulu, Amazon Prime, every you know everyone's creating content that's original content because vying for a subscription that all has the same content doesn't provide much differentiation at all. But I think what Quibi demonstrated is how challenging that can be to create a new service with unique content, even if you have unlimited money. Yes. I think you're exactly right. And it also proved the fact that every great idea isn't gonna have a great outcome at times. 
So how do you take an idea and transform it into being great? And then how is it relevant? I think that's the big point. Everybody wants to know what the key differentiation is and what's relevant for me. And I want to buy it based on relevance and based on differentiation and based on me being that valued customer that you understand what I'm looking for. And that goes back to data. That goes back to content flow analytics. That goes back to ensuring that you know the customer that you're trying to achieve a sale for. So it's all goes back to that customer journey and how we look at it. And then how do you place the big bets and how do you transform and how do you stay relevant? And companies right now are struggling. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and some companies actually are benefiting from this trend. Other companies are, def- are not and it has to do with how they're responding, both strategically, tactically and culturally. But for Quimby, okay. I have a question for you, and this is more your area of expertise in general than mine is do you think that if not for the pandemic, meaning if people continue to be in motion and mobile, which is like the idea behind Quibi for the most part, do you think they would have succeeded or are there other problems with what they were trying to do? You know, I think they would have had a much better shot at succeeding. And I think that unfortunately the pandemic hit at the wrong time for them. It hit at the wrong time for all of us, to be honest. Uh, We would have preferred for it not to. But um, I think at the time they did every, they poured everything into trying to make it successful and there's just nothing they could do at that point. And I think, you know, launching it at a different time might have had a different success story. And, you know, to your point, it just changed. COVID changed the way we do everything, the way we shop, the way we think, the way we go out, and certainly the way we use our devices. And that was going to be challenging and problematic. And unfortunately, you know, no matter the passion that went behind it, the funding and how good of an effort they tried, it just hit at the wrong time. And I think that, you know, we can look at companies in the past that same thing has happened. And you look at even, you know, you look at Kodak. Kodak is now not, right, the number one brand of taking pictures because they never pivoted and changed. But it also hit at the wrong time when the iPhone was released. So it's just that intersection of what's going on in the marketplace at the time that a product's being released. And that one just was bad timing because it showed incredible promise at the start. Look, I have a high degree of paranoia around complacency and some of it is just bad luck. And I also feel like it's difficult for anyone to hit multiple home runs in their lives unless you're a... Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or somebody like that, right? Well, um, I mean, yeah. if you look at it, some of them, some of their ideas didn't make it out of the park either to start, of right? Of and course. they had to come back and keep doing it. You know, it's uh, Thomas Edison found 2,000 ways that did not work to create that light bulb. And he yeah. only found one way that made it work. So yeah. there are times when you have to keep going back to the drawing board and saying, what's going to be relevant? And I think, you know, throughout my career, I watched it at AT AT&T. There were several things that were brilliantly brought out that we ended up saying the market's either not ready Mm -hmm. um, or it's not the right time. And we had to pivot and all the work that went into it, you know, it's part of your heart, soul and passion, but we had to shut it down in order to keep moving forward. And a lot of it is the external factors that can't be controlled. And a lot of it is the market, what's going on in it. So that's when you start looking at it and thinking it's a lot of times, um, a lot of luck with a lot of skilled people that are working on the technology to make it work. Yeah, no, I mean, I think our job is to try to at least control the things that we can and not getting getting in our own way. Um, but, you know, this Kodak, BlackBerry, RIM, I used to keep, I had the original page of BlackBerry that I bought because I was a nerd from like 2001. So I, I, I still had, I kept it on my desk at work as like a reminder of like, don't be complacent. Don't take exactly. anything for granted. You know. No, I loved the BlackBerry, right? And they never yeah. pivoted and moved either. And Kodak did the same thing. They just didn't stay relevant. Blockbuster never thought Netflix was going to take off, right? Yeah. So it's all the ones that became complacent with where they were, and they weren't mm-hmm. willing to take that risk and pivot. Even if they had lost, they would have taken the risk and at least shown that they were still relevant. You know, in 1999, in my undergraduate business course, my group did a 
a recommendation, a pitch to the blockbuster board, like a mock pitch about how they can transform. I'm going to share that with you. I'm still very that proud of it. That would be awesome. Like, that would be me. awesome because, you know, and it's the sometimes the short sightedness of who's running it at the time that thinks that yeah. their widget, their product is going to be so successful, everybody will just want to come and consume it. And sometimes right. it's just not going to be there. That's right. Um, hey, we didn't spend any time on this. I want to go back to it, though, because I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm a huge proponent, as you know, of diversity and inclusion. And I think our industry has been really generally terrible at it. Um, I think we're getting better at it. Uh, it's people like you, though, who got in early and broke new ground for everyone else. And looking at your career, like from going from journalism to technology, like, can you just spend a little bit of time on how that was, how you even did that or wanted to do that? And then how you broke like the, the ceiling that probably existed for especially female leaders in tech, um, you know, in the last decade or two. Well, I always found, and it was funny, I started, like I said, in music, um, math is music. So I had the propensity to code early and I thought it was fascinating and fun and uh, switched over to journalism because the one thing I found was nobody could explain the technology. So everybody could create it. Everybody could code. Nobody could explain it. So that's really where I found my sweet spot. So that's why I went into journalism was to ensure I had the skill of putting what's important front and foremost in everybody's mind and then turning around, getting into the technology. The one thing I did was I tried to make myself the most valuable player. So I keep a curious and curiosity of learning to this day. I mean, I am still online taking courses really? and getting nano degrees on everything wow. because I want to make sure I stay relevant and I want to make sure that I'm learning the next greatest thing and that it's relevant where I'm at. And so every six months I go back and get a nano degree because that to me wow. is how you keep learning and how you keep going. And I want to keep honing in on my skill set and making sure I don't forget how to code. That's not my primary skill set, that, but I'm not going to forget it. <laughs> that explains a lot. Um, it's very also inspiring. And it's, it's good to know we share the same paranoia about obsolescence. <laughs> And that's correct. And, you know, AT&T gave me the grace of I had a varied career and got to move around a lot. And uh, their AT&T's philosophy was play every position to where you can lead teams of it. Because if you don't know what the position is, you're never going to be able to lead the team. And yeah. so I worked in release management. I worked in project management. I worked in uh, networking. So I was able to gleam all of those different skill sets to be able to lead the teams that was doing it. Oh yeah, um, that's how you get the credibility. And you have to be able to go in, maybe not write code as well, but be understand like what's going on here, right? I think that's super important. You have to understand it. You have to be able to talk about containerization. You have to understand what a cloud is. It's not a big white puffy thing through the sky, right? And you have to be able to articulate it in such a way that people want to consume it and get excited by it because that's really what the sweet spot is. And so you're right. I remember I was at a Hadoop summit when it's 2011. Wow. And uh, yep, in California in San Jose. And I will never forget there was only 13 uh, women there out of 2,700. <laughs> yeah, not surprised. Not and surprised. so, you know, it was at the time groundbreaking. Everybody would always, uh, you know, look around and say, well, you're the only female here. And uh, I used to say, yep, let's get it going on. Let's get, let's get a decision made. Let's get started. And part of it was just staying relevant and making sure that I had an equal voice in the room and having male advocates that are also there to help. I would never have gotten where I have if I didn't have the advocates there to say, she deserves a seat at the table. And yeah, she knows no, what she's I, talking about. Look, one of my most influential moments or you know of, of being influenced i think in a significant way first of all my interactions with google cloud and the leadership there whether it's nina harding or carolee gerhardt or kristen cliphouse or jenna kennedy i mean all female powerhouses but like the the cultural awareness at google around these topics is so inspiring because as a small company you don't always think about the importance of those things and you're like and and you're you're raised to believe like 
if you're merit based, everything just takes care of itself, and that's not ex exactly true. But I remember being invited by Google Cloud through a channel company event called Women in Technology, yeah. which grew from 100 people to like a thousand in New York last year. Um, and I was, it was like the shoe was on the other foot. I was one of the four men there, or <laughs> six men there. And I got to be on stage on a panel talking about the role of advocates and champions. And it's, it's really important because it's also nuanced. Like you're a man, like, why are you talking about this, you know, being, you know, female or you're Caucasian. Why are you talking about black lives or, you know, minority and diversity? It's like, actually it's exactly, it's exactly the right time to talk about it. And it's exactly our job to talk about it. Well, exactly. And you look at it this way, look at the footprint of all of our customers. They're yeah. not the same as we are. Everyone isn't going to look like me. So I have to make sure that we have the same look and feel back to the customers that we're supporting. So having that diversity, having the split between female and male, having the diversity of color, having the diversity of all of the different um, cultures that are brought in, that's what makes it special for companies. That's what makes it special for everyone. And making sure everybody has a voice and a seat at the table. I think a lot of times you may put them at the table, but you don't give them a voice. And so making sure that we're stewards of that, um, that yeah. to me is one of our sweet spots. I mean, I spend time in middle schools and high schools and colleges because I want to make sure we take the message to the next generation. Yeah. And that we don't forget that as well. Um, and I'm not to still change it. I'm still one of the few girls in a room some days. And I look around and I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, but that just gives us time to be able to say, we have work to do and that's okay. So that's why I still stay in this game and fight and have some fun with it and be able to at least be able to one, be one of the ones to try to inspire our next generation to stay in tech. Because That's you see a lot of people leaving um, and we're down in colleges. My goodness, we're down to less than 30 percent again. Right. A female in tech. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. We're dropping again. So driving the people to say this is where it can be fun. This is where it can be challenging. Look at the careers you can have. I mean, I've had a ball in cybersecurity and working in cybersecurity events and uh, different things. So it's just an ex fascinating field that we just have to stay relevant in and be able to explain to everyone else, come and join me. Don't let me be alone. Come sit the, with me. The reality is, as you know, there's, there's, there's more demand than supply for this type of work that we all collectively do for the foreseeable future. So if we can't create an inspiring, attractive, safe space for not just women, which is half the population, but really everyone, yes. including immigrants and imports and all the great yes. people we can get from the world, like we're not going to win because we yes. need everybody. And, and so we all have a role to play in creating the on ramp, you know, for people to join at different levels in their career, like we were doing with Sada University and other things, which is awesome. And, you know, that, those are going to be the leaders of tomorrow, right? And those are going to be the ones that drive further change. Um, but that, that work has to start now or has to continue, I should say, which we can't let off because we need everyone. We need everyone. Exactly. And Saudi University, all right, spend two minutes on Saudi University because that to me is so exciting. Um, and I want to make sure that you get a plug in for that because that is probably one of the most inspiring things that I've uh, ticked across on my little bucket list of things that I loved coming out. So why don't you take a minute on that one? Sure. I appreciate that. No, it's, we're in a second cohort. Half of the cohort uh, comes from NSBE, I think, as well. So National Society of Black Engineers. And it's an amazing talent. One of the women on the talent on, on, on that team, Tina, I just found out she's like, she's like, I came from Nigeria to the U S to go to get my master's with a seven month old or something like that. I was like, Oh my God. Like whenever, if we think we're like having a rough time, cause you know, the postmates delivery is late. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, come, like reality check, like people have go through amazing things and, and she's going to be wonderful. Um, and we have just uh, so many stories like that. And I love what uh, Sada looks like and feels like, not only because it matches the market, but 
it's absolutely a competitive advantage. And, and, you know, the Medici group and Francis Johansson, and he's been on this podcast and we're partnering with them on internal programs at SADA and other things. Um, diversity is a competitive advantage. And if anybody doesn't realize that, it's like, how do you, and he called this organization the Medici effect because um, the Medici family in Venice and the Renaissance were the Renaissance because a amalgamation of ideas came together from different parts of the world in one place. That's why so much innovation happened, right? So it's, um, I love the topic. I'm passionate about it. We all have a role to play. We all need to get started. Well, it's, it's just, it's a journey. And it's one that if we can't turn around and make sure we're lifting up the next generation and others that are changing and pivoting careers, especially during COVID-19, and give them a shot and say, look, let me come along and help. Let's see what we can do together. So I am just passionate about Saudi University. So I had to make sure we took a few moments on that because it's been an amazing journey to watch. I appreciate that. Well, that's, I think that's a great segue. Tina, how come you've been in a position to watch? <laughs> how did, what do you mean? You work at Google. Um, so, hey, let's just tell, let's just come clean with it. Let's tell the audience. So Tina and I met, I think we cold called her literally because we were building our first ever set of independent board members and we cold called her. She took our call and it, it felt like an immediate match. And it was an ama it was amazing for, for many months, several board meetings. And then um, that's why she knows about Sada University. She knows a lot about Sada. <laughs> She's seen, seen a lot from the seat of the board. And uh, we were dealt with the uh, simultaneously exciting and sad news that she was getting this fantastic role within Google. And, you know, when Phil Moyer and I and you had that uh, chat on the email, uh, I, I take 5% credit for this outcome. Totally agree. I think you should take 10. How about 10? that? We'll give you 10. Right. Yeah, let's give you to at least 10. <laughs> but you and that's have why... that board seat, which is okay, because we learned a lot from you in a short period of time, and we're going to build, continue to build a great board. And we still have Lucina and Wendy, who are awesome um, and very active. But um, I think where you landed at Google, the timing is fantastic. I think ultimately it's great for the ecosystem, great for customers, great for us because we're so focused on uh, telco media entertainment. TMEG and gaming, I guess you could throw in there as Google likes to say uh, in their vernacular. But can you tell us about your charter? Why now? Why did you even take this role? What are they trying to build? What's Phil and Kristen and everybody trying to do? Uh, in Google Cloud with your with your group? Oh, that's a great question. And it's funny. So Google Cloud's mission is accelerate every organization's ability to transform digitally through data powered innovation. So if you think about it, that means you're on the cusp of doing something different new and exciting. And so when uh, Google asked if I would come over, it really energized me to say, gosh, I want to be at the cutting edge of that innovation. I want to be able to be the one to say, let me show you how you can transform your business. So when you think about the telcos, there's still so much that can be done. And to your point, they're now conglomerates again. So how do we help enable them to do more? And you look at media and entertainment, oh my goodness, we are just on the cusp of yeah. being able to ensure that we can help them transform and their customer data journeys. And then you turn around and look as we're going in the gaming and the gaming is exploding. So think about it from this oh, perspective. Yeah. Everybody's at home. So what are they doing? They're playing Fortnite. They're playing every game there is, right? I mean, this is now what, you know, you look across and it totally takes away what country you're from because everybody's language is the same in gaming. So now you have the kids playing gaming, you have everybody across all nations playing, whatever game it is. So it's an exploding time. Yeah. And they're seeing workloads, they're seeing, uh, we're seeing things that we have never seen before in the industry that you typically only see over holiday. And now we're saying, yeah. how do you take what you see over a holiday and expand it into a full year? So really, as we're starting to look at it, it's looking at the industry from the eyes of the industry. So it's yeah. making a, a, a different play 
to say, here's what we're differentiating. And we look at it not only from just the telco, media, entertainment, and gaming, but we're looking at it from across Google. What can we do to be able to enable the customer? And it yeah. goes back to that uh, powered innovation. Yeah, I think, look, I think uh, telco, media, entertainment, the reason they're together is because there's so much overlap now. Like you can't really put, where, where, where would you put at and or a dish or any of these folks, right? It's like they do all those things. Um, and a lot of it has been built on their own resources and their own data centers and they're all rent their own rendering farms, their own security infrastructure, their own whatever, whatever. And look, at the end of the day, that's the core competency for someone like AT&T, perhaps, and it should continue to be. But with the, regards to like the touch points that get you to the customer interaction, serving customers, the creative arts, like wouldn't it be beautiful if the technology kind of disappeared and you weren't thinking about it as you were trying to build, you weren't thinking about the limitations. Right, no, you're exactly right. So think about it. Does a data center really differentiate a business? Probably not. No. However, they've got to find the business value that does differentiate them. So if you lift and shift and give that to someone else to worry about, then you can really drive the business value and the products that make that business successful. Because to your point, that's not their core competency. It's yeah. not what they wake up every day, feet hit the ground, excited to get to work to say, how do I make your life simplistic? How do I get everything easily into the cloud? How can I help you transform? How do I keep it secure? And how do I make sure you go about doing the things that you were designed to do for your business? Yeah. That's really what we're trying to do is really rethink how all of it works and let businesses get back to thinking, how am I going to go from thriving and how am I going to go from surviving to thriving, right? right? Sometimes some of them are just surviving, but how do we get them to thriving? How do we make it exciting for them? Yeah. And that's where I think that intersection becomes with our group, how we can help them see a vision um, that perhaps, you know, as they're looking at it now, they haven't thought before and they thought we're okay with what we have. And now they're saying, Maybe we're not. Yeah, you know, and you could argue that Google Cloud was late to the vertical strategy. I would agree. I would agree. Maybe late. You could argue not really late because of where the business was, but certainly others have had a vertical strategy longer. You could That's also true. argue in the same vein that Google was late to TMEC or ME. Yep. And so what do you see the opportunity now that Google's gonna bring to market for those customers that's highly differentiated from the other players? You know, when I look at it, it's the ecosystem that we bring. It's not just a Google Cloud. And yes, we are um, later coming up, um, coming into the marketplace from that perspective, but we bring the one Google across. And I think that's really what differentiates us. When you start looking at all of the products that we have and all of the innovation and all the technology across the Google families, that's really what makes the difference. That's when you can say, oh, I can see a difference. I can see how we can collaborate together. I can see how we can look at 5G and Edge and Mech from a different perspective because I'm bringing not only the technology, but I'm bringing the power of Google all the way across it. Yeah, and we've seen, we've seen this start to play uh, play out more effectively than ever before. And these are public, you know, uh, wind wires around Activision or even, um, you know, Sabre and others that are uh, massive deals. And they're, they're really not about just lift and shift. They're not even just about the data center or the data. It's about bringing one Google into a strategic conversation. And only, you know, TK has been the most successful by far in all yeah. the different leadership in Google Enterprise to be able to do that for various reasons. But I think also, and Sundar, as you hear out the earning reports and how they're talking about cloud, like this is the growth engine of Alphabet. That's correct. And we are challenging the status quo in the marketplace. And mm -hmm. if you think about, we talked about it earlier, we don't want to be stagnant. 
we want to be the next ones looking at it. So, you know, whether it's our devices from Chromebooks, whether it's um, when you're looking at APIs, whether you're looking at maps, how do we bring all of that technology and then apply it to where it is to make your lives easier? Yeah. So it's a completely different way of looking at it than I believe our challenges challengers are looking at it. And so when we come in, it's that power. It's the power of one together. Yeah, and look, it's uh, the assets that Google has are completely unique. They're not what you know AWS or Microsoft can bring to the table. I think they might may have been better in the past at doing that. That's changing. Um, I know it's a top priority for you and for Phil and for Lori and like in the solutions team, a huge priority for Rob and TK. Um, and we're seeing more, more of these deals like Activision was not about, hey, Activision, get out of the data center business. I was like, we want to transform gaming and there's Stadia and there's YouTube. And like, that's the kind of conversation that's being had. And it's so exciting to be um, to be part of that journey with you. And um, I think we're just getting started in so many ways. God. Oh, absolutely. You look at the people Lord. that we're investing in. You look at the talent we're investing in and the partners like mm -hmm. Sada. You look at how we're investing together to make a difference in the industry and with the customers. And they're starting to show up and say, we want to be part of that. Totally. And it's the excitement of it. And you look at all of the expanding products and cloud in the regions all of it becomes that differentiation because it's the power of us together and it's the power of making the difference. And that's the passion that I believe that we bring to the market that you're not seeing in the other two. And that's what I love to see is that power of um, together, togetherness and partnerships. Yeah, I could see it and I've seen it already uh, shift where ads really you know ran things that ads own the primary relationship with customers now i see like actually the cloud reps own the primary relationship especially in select but and then everybody else kind of drafts behind them and it's just a beautiful thing to be able to bring it all together and i can't wait to see how it evolves especially under your leadership and um and you know we're investing with that leadership you met you met andy right it was awesome from disney and and he's going to contribute in a, in a huge way um, and I think we're going to end the year strong and 2021 will be like a huge, um, growth year yet again, which is what we exactly what we expect. Uh, and I'm just really looking forward to it. So, oh, um, I am too. And I'm looking forward to the continued partnership because this is where we can look at the industry and say, how can we help them place the big bets for what's next? How do we help them rethink possible? How do we help them really achieve what they're looking for from that business value to be able to soar? And I think that as we continue on that journey together, that's what customers are looking for. That's what businesses are looking for. And that'll keep them thriving, not only in 2021, but beyond. That's right. Well, thank you so much for being our guest. It was an thank honor you. to have you, pleasure to have you. I'm so glad that if, if you have to leave SADA and our board, <laughs> this is the one place that I'd hope you end up at. And um, I'm, I'm so happy that we get to continue to work together in a, in a slightly different capacity. I do too. I'm telling you, I wouldn't have taken it if I couldn't keep working with you. That's how much I absolutely <laughs> love y'all. And so that's why I'm glad it worked out that we could continue our journey together. Thank you so much for being my guest, Tina. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.